As you all know, uh, my name is Adrian Adams, and you know because I just told you, uh, I use they, them pronouns, and I am a third year PhD student in American Studies and Ethnicity and one of the co-organizers, along with the person who's about to introduce herself, into Losing Ground at 40. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Hi, my name is A.E. Stevenson. Um, I'm Assistant Professor of Gender and Sexuality Studies at USC. Um, alongside Adrian, we came together to um, plan this event. We are just so thrilled to have you join us for the second day of Losing Ground at 40. Um, yesterday, we held a screening and talked back at the Academy Museum. How many of y'all were there for that? Yes. Damn. So exciting. Um, wow, we were really just so moved to, for us to both see this on the big screen. Um, I know it was like one of my, I think my second time seeing it on a big screen, not like on a laptop or anything like that. So. Yeah, and I feel like the consistent thing we've gotten from folks is like experiencing it with other people and like the moments of laughter or of pause, the campiness of the film at times, the lighting, the sound, like it was a full immersive experience. And I think that was one of the reasons we wanted to do Losing Ground at 40 was to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Kathleen Collins his film is to reckon with the fact that the film is almost as old as Kathleen Collins when she passed from breast cancer at the age of 46. So to think about an anniversary as a way to reckon with the relationship between black and death and black artistic worlds that are built. And so this film and her entire repertoire, which it's so grateful to have Nina Collins, who's done so much preservation work, who's right over here, to think through how this work has mentored even as she's in the afterlife, that there's a way in which the dialogues that are happening today are showing that the mentorship happens even when there's a multivarious corporeal form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so me and Adrian, just give a little back history of how this event came to be. Me, Adrian, and Alex met in Zakia Iman Jackson's class in the fall of 2020. Um, virtually, of course, um, and you know, I mentioned to Adrian that this was my favorite film, and they had never had the chance to see it. So, um, you know, Adrian saw it and messaged me and was like, "I think the 40th anniversary of this is coming up," and we were like, "We have to do something," you know. Um, and Adrian, you know, I recently had got in the position at USC, and Adrian informed me about this wonderful grant through the Vision and Voices Fund um, at USC. Um, and we applied and we're so grateful to receive this grant that has helped us fly in some of the greatest scholars, some of the greatest practic film practitioners to come be with us for this weekend. So it's been a really an honor and it's really something to see the dream kind of manifest into corporeality. And so in terms of the film, to give a synopsis is to already be insufficient because you say that there's a uh, philosophy professor and her painter husband during a summer when they go up to uh, to Rockland County, New York, and then it's like actually every single scene is worth a Duke University Press book <laughs> immediately. <laughs> and so to think that something like that was made with a budget that was like 125000 ish Taxes not included, may be included, I'll confirm during the second panel, mm -hmm. but that there's something she was trying to do in, in terms of exploring ecstasy and yet watching that film is ecstasy. It is an ecstatic experience watching it in all of the different venues. And so all to say, it's Inception before Christopher Nolan ever thought of Inception. <laughs> yeah. So just to give an itinerary for how the rest of the day will go, um, today's conversations will range from a number of themes central to Collins' work, including artistic form, lighting, black film history, black stardom, and ecstasy. Um, first, I will be in conversation with Professor L.H. Stallings, and then we'll have a short break. And then next, Alex Hack will moderate a conversation with Professor Zina Buirene Davis, Philana Payton, and Samantha Shepard. Finally, be sure to join us for our closing reception with music and appetizers, and we'll just be a celebration of the end of this wonderful event. All right, so speaking of the tragic mulatto crisis, um, <laughs> one, one thing that, you know, this is a standard opening remarks, but we're getting into the thank you section, which I know 
when it's an award show setting, it's like, cool, you know people. I don't really need to know the name of your agent. But this event truly would not be possible. So for the folks you know, the folks you want to know, you like their name, you like their style, like give, give us something. A little bit, a little bit. Applause, give us some snaps, give us some vibes when you hear these names. Yes, yes. So to begin, we would love to thank our co-organizers, the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures and the California African American Museum. We must also thank our funders, Vision and Voices. We have a representative here, I lost sight of him, but thank you. David, in the back, yes. And of course, our co-sponsor is the Africana Research Cluster, the Center for Feminist Research, and Consortium on Gender, Sexuality, Race, and Public Culture, all of part of the University of Southern California. Do you want to go? Yeah, go. Um, and I would like to also thank our speakers, Jacqueline Stewart, Nina Collins, Julie Dash, L.H. Stallings, Alex Heck, Samantha Shepard, Lana Payton, and Zanabu Armin Davis. Wait, I don't think you all understand. We have Julie Dash, L.H. Stallings, Falana Payton, in the, and all of these speakers, and then we got a subtle clap. I think L.A.'s reign has fucked with people's minds severely, if that's the case. So can we do one more, just a little something? All right. Okay, that feels better for my experience. So in terms of the behind the scene folks, we have Rebecca Zobeck, who was doing all the reservations and payments, and you know USC is not easy with any of those. <laughs> we have our catering company, Hera and Ara, who will be here shortly. You'll see them in the back. Um, Alexandra Mitchell, please a big round of applause for Cam, holding it down for us on those emails. <laughs> David Delgado, Timothy Liu, we have Momo in the house. When you see the photographer, and his amazing brown-hued sweatshirt. Ooh, right over there, look. Look over there. And finally, to our incredible interpreters, Andrea Lust and Amelia Boyk. Finally, we would like to acknowledge the Tongva and Shamash networks as the original and continued stewards of the land we are on today. Moreover, parts of Losing Ground were filmed on the Shituka and Munsi Lenape land. The goal here is to also pose the land acknowledgement as a question to the estrangement of blackness and indigeneity. What happens when we put native and black folks in the same frame, attuned to Afro-native intimacy in the Americas? What does land stewardship look like in the wake of both slavery's afterlives and indigenous genocide? And to end on both a contemplative note and also a fun note, A and I have some sequels for Losing Ground if you want to hear. We have two, real quick, real quick. I'm going to go first. Losing Sound, which is actually when Sorette Scott's character becomes a professor emeritus but has to deal with Zoom fatigue during the pandemic and audio issues. We have Losing Hound. Think Turner and Hooch, but black, trans, and directed by Surratt Scott's character's student. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Losing Pound. Losing Pound, yeah. <laughs> All right, and without further ado, let's begin with our first conversation between me and L.H. Falling. Cool. I'm Collins Artistic Form and Black Independent Filmmaking. My name is Alex Hack. I'm a PhD candidate at USC in Cinema and Media Studies. Um, specializing in black health and medical racism. I'm overwhelmingly honored um, to be here today, especially given the company, and to be a part of this event as a whole. Um, I want to thank both AE and Adrian for putting this on, which is wonderful. <laughs> and also my fellow panelists for being here. I'll be moderating, and um, I'm beyond excited to be here with these three brilliant women. Um, okay, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them. Uh, okay. Yeah, Zenim, I, I've asked her three times how to pronounce her name because I'm genuinely terrified. <laughs> Zainabu Irene Davis is an independent filmmaker and professor of communication at the University of California, San Diego, 
Her work is passionately concerned with the depiction of women of African descent. A selection of her award-winning works includes Mother of the River, A Powerful Thing, and Cycles. Her dramatic feature film entitled, entitled Compensation was selected for the dramatic competition at the 2000 Sundance Film Festival and won the Gordon Parks Award for directing for, from the Independent Feature Project in 1999. And a restoration and release of the film by the Criterion Collection is in the works for 2023. Her most recent documentary, Spirits of Rebellion, Black Cinema from Los Angeles, won seven awards, including the African Movie Academy Award and Best Feature Documentary and Audience Award from Black Star. Professor Davis has received numerous grants and fellowships from such sources as California Humanities, National Black Programming Consortium, Rockefeller Foundation, the American Film Institute, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Davis is currently working on two films, a dramatic short about an experience of COVID-19 entitled Pandemic Bread, and a hybrid documentary, Stars of the Northern Sky, which tells the stories of the legal trials of abolitionists Sojourner Truth, Phyllis Wheatley, and Marie Joseph Angelique. Dr. Philana Payton is an assistant professor of film and media studies at the University of California, Irvine. She was previously awarded a UC Chancellor's postdoctoral fellowship in the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Her research focus uses black studies, performance theory, and film theory to explore blackness and visual culture through black women's performances. Dr. Payton has also done extensive archival research on early 20th century black silent cinema and has conducted race and gender analyses on classical era films through today's cinema, television, and media. She has published work in Film Quarterly, Seen by Black Star, and Film Criticism, and is currently working on her first manuscript tentatively titled Celestial Bodies, Black Women, Hollywood, and the Fallacy of Stardom. Um, Samantha Noel Shepard is an associate professor of cinema and media studies at Cornell University and author of Sporting Blackness, Race Embodiment, and okay, <laughs> for the interpreters. Okay, <laughs> um, I'm going to start again. Samantha Noel Shepard is associate professor of cinema and media studies at Cornell University and author of Sporting Blackness, Race Embodiment, and Critical Muscle Memory on Screen, and co-editor of From Media. Sorry. From Media to Media Mogul, Theorizing Tyler Perry and Sporting Realities, Critical Readings on the Sports Documentary. She has published essays in academic and popular venues such as Film Quarterly, The Atlantic, Flash Art International, and Los Angeles Review of Books. She has been featured most recently on the podcast American Prodigies and Turner Classic Movies. Her latest essay, Deep Cuts, was commissioned for Tiana Nikia McLaughlin's exhibition, The Trace of an Implied Presence, co-produced by Nike and The Shed. She is currently working on a co-edited collection with Alex Beeston and Haley O'Malley dedicated to Kathleen Collins' plays and screenplays, as well as two book projects, The Basketball Film, A Cultural and Transmedia History, under contract with Rutgers University Press, and A Black Hole, Phantom Cinemas, and, Reimagining, and the Reimagining of Black Women's Media Histories, a project for which she was named a 2021 Academy Film Scholar by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Um, it's also worth mentioning um, that very much in line with the feminist genealogies that we've been tracing throughout this event, um, that both Professor Payton and Professor Shepard have worked with Professor Davis before and received different types of mentorship from her as well. Okay, I'd like to start by kind of giving the three of you the space to talk about the influence of Collins and losing ground on your own work, but also, you know, just on your life. <laughs> Let the old lady go first. Okay, I hear you. Yeah. Um, thank you all for being here, and thank you for having this event. Thank you to Dina once more for preserving the mother's work for us. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, I just want to say that I was very fortunate to meet Kathleen at a very early stage in my career. Um, I believe that I was at a film festival um, at, it could have been at Howard or it was in Philly, but I'm not, I don't exactly have the, the particulars of it, but I know that Kathleen and Hailey were there, Hailey Garima were there, and if you all know anything about Hailey and Kathleen, you don't get an edge word, a, a word in edgewise, you just listen. Um, and that was, that was a very cool experience um, for me as somebody who wasn't sure where, I knew I wanted to do film because I'd studied in Kenya, East Africa, um, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And Kathleen's um, encouragement and support um, really pushed me. And for me, um, I lost my mother when I was 22 to cancer and I was always looking for other women to kind of fill that void and for a time your mom did fill that for me so her loss at such a young age the same age as my mother is 46 was kind of devastating for me as well and that is one of the reasons why beginning of the film that most people know me for which is cycles there's a dedication to your mother and to another filmmaker by the name of Hugh Robertson. Um, and I wanted to say that I think what's interesting about the two of them, they both passed in the same year in 88 um, months um, from each other. Hugh Robertson um, was the director of a film called Melinda and worked on, um, I think it was um, Butch Cassidy, and, no, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll go back to that then correct it, but he has a BAFTA award for editing, and I think editing was what really kind of set these two particular filmmakers up because it was their experiences as editors was what helped to propel them into making changes formally with the way that you would use cinema as a universal language to tell stories. So I just wanted to set that up for you all um, right at the very beginning. Um, I think in terms of my own work, um, I am what Kathleen was. I am a professor and I am a filmmaker. And that was, sometimes when that gets hard, I do go back and look at those um, Vimeo uh, movies of Kathleen Masterclass. Um, at Howard University. Anybody can look at those. It's a two hour long video where she does talk to, does a master class at Howard. And she does talk about her motivations for doing films the way that she does them. And I think that the, and, and also the commitment to making sure that she shared this knowledge with others. And so, um, it wasn't an accident that Kathleen used the students from City College to create her film, um, or her films. And she worked with one of her former students, Ronald Gray, to develop a cinema language between the two of them to tell stories of black life as she experienced it. And so I do kind of the same thing. The other thing that I think um, Kathleen gave me was that it was permission to do what the hell you wanted to do, period, full stop. Because Cruz Brothers and Miss Malloy is about a white lady with three Puerto Rican dudes in it. And I was like, what? What is a black woman who's making this movie from? It's the same thing with Julie, with Illusions. You got this, like, you know, biracial woman in a, a, a Hollywood studio in the 40s. You can do whatever stories you want. And then she was really someone who supported you saying whatever stories you want. My new film that I'm working on now, Pandemic Bread, is about a Filipina interpreter taking an end of life call with a Filipina elder in, in the hospital with an African immigrant woman doctor presiding over this discussion of end of life. That's Kathleen, man. That's Kathleen saying, telling me 
that I can do these things even when other people tell you that you can't. Most of, you know, most of the industry, whatever, telling you, no, you can't do these things. As Julie says, is that permissible? Yep, it's not permissible. I mean, it's supposed to be not permissible, but it doesn't matter because we do it. And so that lineage has come down and keeps getting passed on of, of what the cinematic possibilities could be. And so I'm grateful for that as, um, a gift from your mother and a continuing um, spirit that I hope I'm able to pass on to others here as well. <laughs> That's amazing. I also want to join in saying thank you with deep gratitude. You took me from Ithaca. Um, there was a snowstorm. You brought me to the light. <laughs> I would worship at the altar. Um, so thank you so much. And of course, thank you to the organizers. Thank you to Nina, always. Um, so I think how I think about Kathleen's work in relationship to what I'm doing is she really is the inaugural idea of Phantom Cinemas, um, which is a book that I'm working on but it's largely because of the narrative of lost and found is inadequate. And I think Nina actually mentioned towards this. Um, it's, it's actually quite unfair to black feminist creativity to imagine that it has been lost just because it has been neglected, it has been ignored, it has been carefully placed in trunks, in homes, and left till it could be reckoned with. I always think about not to keep making these connections, but I think it's always helpful to Julie Dash's um, Daughter to the Dust, where Yellow Mary says, I have this box and I like to open it and to look at it when I'm ready to, the things. So I, um, I think it's really important. I use the concept of phantom cinemas to say that black women's feminist creativity haunts us. It haunts film history. Um, it's, it's, it's been there and therefore we need to be creative about our interpretations. Um, just like Alice Walker implored us to be in search of our mother's garden, we should also be in search of our mother's cinemas. Um, but not also in the most obvious places. I love that we get to screen Losing Ground on a big screen. I love that there is this theatrical production, but as we have seen with the great work that you have done in terms of sharing the screenplays um, and the plays is that black women's ideas and black women's media, if we can just stop being so medium focused, is in plethora, the script work. I know we have creators right now in the audience who have work and that work is super valuable. And I think that part of when I think about Kathleen Collins' work and how we are in this moment of rediscovery is that we need different modes of interpretation and speculation, creativity, um, and not to be long-winded, though I certainly could go for days, um, is I'm compelled because when I was interested in thinking about Phantom Cinemas, I was drawn to a Kickstarter campaign by the filmmaker Leslie Harris, who is well known for Just Another Girl in the IRT from 1992. She tried to kickstart a film in the early 2000s called I Love Cinema about a black film professor who was obsessed with Fellini, um, who loved Josephine Baker and was gonna star Jennifer Williams from The Basketball Wives. So I'm hooked, right? And I'm thinking, oh, I need to give money to this. But the Kickstarter campaign had failed. So not only do we have, in terms of our representation, we've all talked about seeing a professor on, which is just this narrative, like there's all these black feminist ideas and lineages in terms of representational politics, in terms of creativity, in terms of work that could have been. And I think that is still a very powerful possibility work that is and work that could have been, that it needs to be classified, engaged with materially, um, and, and notated in some kind of way. So I'm a terrible historian. I don't believe in time, but I think that you need to reckon with the past and the future and speculate on what exists and what doesn't. So that's what her work has really inspired for me, let alone to step up how I dress. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, 
first of all, I'm just so grateful to be on this stage with such fantastic scholars and filmmakers that I've looked up to for so long, so I'm just happy to be here. Um, thank you, A.E. and Adrian, for thinking of me and putting me here. Um, yeah, you know, it's so funny. I, I love that people have mentioned over and over um, returning to work at different times in your life and kind of what it serves. Because honestly, I remember um, me and my, my friends watched um, Losing Ground early, early in while I was in grad school. And I will say I was not necessarily in a place where I was ready to really take it in. Um, but I do remember we watched the film, but we also watched the master class. And I remember seeing, like, I remember visually remembering, like, I did see this master class before. And upon, like, re-immersing myself into um, Losing Ground and Kathleen Kahn's work, I re-watched the master class and realized how impactful that actually had had, like, how impactful it was on my work um, then and now. Um, her centering of, like, complexity in the characters and not necessarily being committed to this idea of representation and a, a, a film or a character having to speak for black women or black audiences in general, but really knowing um, her characters and creating a world that feels intimate, that feels personal. It's not necessarily about like, you know, the interpretation of this being a representation of all black women in academia or anything like that, but that commitment to like, you know, taking away the mythology and extraordinariness around blackness and really being dedicated to character development, being, being dedicated to the intimacy, the interiority of black women. And that has followed me throughout my work and I didn't realize how close it was until returning to it around this time and rereading some things and rereading articles and it's been extremely impactful and I'm, I'm truly truly grateful like I said for the now visibility of the work thank you Nina but also like the, the master class I continue to say like it has inspired me to think even differently about how I'm teaching classes and wanting to think more about how Kathleen's work has influenced so many of the black women creatives that I know now who are invested in the deep, deep interiority of black women and exploring that visually. And I think it leaves so much room for further conversation right now about her influence unknowingly, I think for all of us too, you know? Thank you. I can definitely identify with Polana's experience on that. Um, okay, we're gonna start with some questions. I'd like to start um, by quoting Professor Shepard, who says, <laughs> who says that um, in her work on the LA Rebellion, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm like, I feel like I've like done something now, um, speaks to film that can confirm black people's sense of themselves, their history, and their experiences. Um, and I'm curious how film form can contribute to these efforts, kind of more specifically how community can co affect aesthetics. Um, and kind of further, Kathleen Collins' work consistently fr frames black womanhood. Um, what are your thoughts on black womanhood and as film form? I'll start it off. Yeah, thank you. Um, that quote was good, now that I think about it. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> that girl's a genius. <laughs> Um, no, um, I think part of, part of thinking about losing ground and, and, and reckoning with the, its visuality, reckon, reckoning with um, the experimentation and the engagement and to what you're saying about confirming black people's senses of themselves is that, I mean, the great thing about also the archive that Kathleen Collins provides us, because not everyone does provide an archive, and that's also because for a lot of reasons. One of the, I think you heard Jacqueline Stewart mention an early, um, early silent cinema um, um, black woman filmmaker besides Eloise Gist is Tressie Saunders. And she lived like well into the 1980s, like we had time. Um, and I think that's, that's something right there. But is, Kathleen gave us a lot of ways to understand her writing, which is that she was not interested in black people, as she says, as saints or sinners. She was interested in humanity. She was interested in not mythologizing black life. And I think that's why when, we, when I personally watch the film, and I think it's really actually important that I say I, it's, it's a familiarity that is a resonance 
um, even though it's not my story and it's not meant to be holistic, whether I feel as a professor or, but there is a, a sense of a confirmed regular like she is extraordinary of thinking, extraordinary of contemplation, but like a regular consideration of her life. Um, and I think that film is, is trying to show black people exist humanly in the way that I, this is not a shout out against, mm, this is on camera, but, um, but in the ways that we sometimes say that later in the 1980s about she's got to have it. Oh, black people are just existing. I think that that's also what they're doing here. It's it, they're existing. They're sexy. I mean, Dwayne, the muscles, it's just us a lot. And there's their their being and the film itself is confirming that we, we can go through existential crises. We have complicated relationships with our mother. Um, you know, we have we have loves, we have lives, we have, we have fans, we have aspirations and ambiguity. And I think the film itself opens itself up for so much interpretation um, because it's shot in such a vivid way. It's shot um, even on a limited budget formally in ways that are super interesting. And they've talked about that yesterday, so I won't go over that again. But, um, but I think we're also seeing somebody who had, who had a visual grammar um, a res regarding a kind of black womanness that we can connect through other forms, but certainly is, is about showing black women in a new light. And one more thing, shot beautifully. We are fully seen, like skin color, skin tone, eyes, lit, like the whole not muted into the background. And that's such a skill. We're watching skill and craft. And I think that's another thing that goes to being um, recognizing a black humanity is also by capturing us photogenically in a way that, that renders us on, on screen as, as visible and beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of like what a connection would be with LA Rebellion filmmakers and Kathleen's work, um, the thing that struck me the most last night for seeing it was that um, depiction of the, you know, quotidian moments of life when you're just kind of like in a space and there's light and you're inhabiting the space as a character. So those really like beautiful moments in Killer of Sheep when Casey's just, you know, looking at herself in the mirror, which is actually the back of a pot you know, and then like moving to the connection that my students and I, uh, quick aside, my students um, in 2021, I taught black women filmmakers class and it was the first class that we had in person um, after being in lockdown. And Losing Ground was the one film where my five black girl students, they just, they, they, they acted out. <laughs> they were talking to Victor. They were hollering at Duke, <laughs> hollering at Duke when he, you know, when he's sashaying across and all that kind of stuff. And the other students in the class were like, what? "What? What is going on over here?" You know. But it was a beautiful moment because it also meant once again that what Kathleen did with the work was to capture us in our everyday moments, in our everyday lives, no matter whose life it was or um, how you think people should be. And in particular, last night, the, the couple things that struck me too were, um, again, this was you know, one of the few times when you could see it like in a really beautiful, um, well-lit <laughs> uh, projection screen. So I'm, I'm admiring uh, Carlos's studio and that altar that's in the corner of the studio when Victor walks in is very subtle, but it is there. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> this is pretty amazing because again, this is a depiction of African spiritual practices that we first see maybe with Barbara McCullough's water ritual from 1979, but then we see this kind of reincorporated again in this film in 1982. And we see women filmmakers being the ones who kind of like bring that aspect of 
spirituality and spiritual practices coming out through our works in different sorts of ways. Um, so I'm really um, in, in great awe of that. Um, and the last thing I want to say um, about just this part was the way that Kathleen and Ronald have um, Victor and Sarah embrace in the one time when, we, when they're in bed and we just see them like cuddling each other at night. Man, that was a gorgeous shot. That was a gorgeous piece of filmmaking, you know? It made me feel so good with these like really complex characters that you know is not gonna end up well, but at that moment, it was just like sublime. And you know, as Sam just said, you know, <laughs> you got a whole lot of filmmakers that be filming folks, but they don't necessarily know how to use the light. And that, you know, the, the skin tones in losing ground, this, you know, it's not the same technology that we have now where it's just LED lights and you just throw them up and they look good. This is back in the day when we were using tungsten lights which tend to make things look more yellow or orange. And they just had this like magic that came out on that set in terms of how they frame the characters and how we were able to see the beauty that all of those characters have on the screen. I think it's pretty um, incredible. Yeah. And I mean, quick, I'm just gonna reiterate it just a little bit because I, I feel deeply what you both have said. Um, I think one of the really amazing parts about the experience last night, because it, it was my also my first time seeing it on a big screen and seeing it with a large group of people and getting to like like experience these characters who I've experienced personally in a very like intimate way that I'm like, um, and then hearing the laughter and the call and response in the audience last night felt like it was, um, had everything to do honestly with the kind of film it was, with the style, with the characters, um, and then also like a reimagining of like a spectator experience because of the engagement that it was possible. Um, I, I, I remember like it can be so, it can be easy to kind of get wrapped up in the philosophical language, I think, of the main character, Sarah, to where you kind of get lost. And one of the things that I, I continue to return to is during that master class, Kathleen is like, you know, we did a screening for, you know, community members and, you know, somebody off the, like just a regular person who has no familiarity with this kind of language, all he kept saying was like, that sister can talk, you know what I'm saying? Like, and you don't have to know what she's saying at all. Like I did not, you know, <laughs> I don't know philosophy like that, but like she can talk, you know, and like, even that being able to be translated across so many audiences speaks so well to like how um, intentional her, the way she crafted these characters and how they could connect with anybody despite not necessarily like understanding anything in regards to like what she's actually saying but feeling it and then feeling the emotions and being like irritated with Victor, you know what I'm saying? But like even if you have no experience like that, it was very much like the sensuality, the, the tension, the hostility, the longing in the film felt so tangible and I think it stretches across audiences and it has everything to do with how she was really deeply, deeply invested in building out these characters in a way that you can feel it. And that to me speaks about like black women's dedication to a specific kind of translation of form using, you know, ba basic cinematic techniques or also basic like you know, no, the lack of access and resources to the technology that could, you know, make this film look different or better in some ways, considered in, in Hollywood's words, but like still being able to really, really translate what it's supposed to, to anybody who's watching it. And I think that is something super significant when we're thinking about how form and um, like spectatorship, how they, they're in conversation, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with resources and money to do something like that, you know? Yeah. This is actually, you did a great job segueing into our <laughs> next question. Um, the film is beautifully shot in color. It's like incredibly vibrant. 
Um, and I think in contrast to a lot of films, media that deals with a kind of proximity to whiteness, like Victor's husband accuses her of having a mulatto crisis. Um, and we kind of hear that consistently throughout the film. Um, often it's, films will be shot in black and white to kind of produce a confusion or a disorientation around color. Um, but yeah, their skin tones are there, they're present. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to the film's use of color. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that question by saying I'll speak to, I think it's such a vivid and vibrant film um, in, in, in so many different places in the film and it's like we've talked about already shot wonderfully. The choice of costume is actually really interesting to think about in terms of how color is being rendered, whether she's in the classroom and, um, and it's the white, you know, button up um, or the beige, but it's interesting to see also how she uses color for Sarah um, in those places. And then when we see her in her leisure time, the kinds of clothing that she chooses, the kind of vividness and the way she begins to stand out in the frame in a different way. She stood out because she was dressed the nines in the classroom, but we were actually in the clothing wise, we were, as you said, knee deep in the chest. Um, it, that wasn't where we were at, but as she left, she's she's changing. So she's in all these hues of blue and then the purples, and then we've got the great pink. Um, and so I think that there's also a way that we see her visually coming to a kind of consciousness about her quest for ecstasy and for self-realization and subjectivity through her clothes, through the kind of vividness of her character, getting more and more bright with what she's choosing to wear. Um, so that's one of the places that I see it. But I think it's also shooting in such a lush environment, um, allowing color to be um, part of the visual palette and to the painterliness of the film. And I think to Kathleen's extreme credit, this is someone who was so deeply engaged with artists, both written and visual artists, um, that she had an ex a beautiful eye and an appreciation for the relationship between artistic forms and collaboration and community. So it was always going to be a sumptuous palette. Or maybe it wasn't always going to be, but it, it certainly turned into a sumptuous palette. And I just wanted to quickly say, um, when I was watching on the screen last night, the composition um, and the slowness of the shots, I think really, really are something to be reflected on and talk more about. Um, she, she pauses on a lot of really, really just beautiful scenes. And I think one that I didn't think a lot about before last night was um, at some point she goes to like a Catholic altar, like a church, mm -hmm. um, and is kneeling in front of, yeah. And it was, a, once again, a slow, slow shot and being able to take in everything that was going on and just the ways that I think they had to be very, very clear about the kind of compositions of the shots they were taking, it becomes obvious, you know, like later on, but it's like, wow, like there's so much intentionality around this looking like an actual portrait. I could take a still of this and it looked like a painting, you know, I could take a still of this and it looks like some beautiful photography. Um, yeah, tableaus, yeah, and I hadn't really thought about it in that way until seeing, like being able to take it in on such a full, full screen. Want me to go or no? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, I would just, I think you all both have covered it really um, well, so not to, pe to keep um, harping on it, but I think I would just transition to the idea of um, the way that um, Ronald and Kathleen collaborated on the shots themselves because um, as we already mentioned, and Julie talked about it yesterday, the way that, that um, the takes were, they're, they're long takes, meaning that the time you turn on the camera to the time you turn off the camera, it's a long period of time where the actors are moving in the space. And it's, just, it's a similar space. They're not, she's not going to extreme close-ups or any kind of like, you know, where we traditionally get shot traditionally get taught um, close-up, reaction shot, another close-up. That's not what she's doing here. And it's not what, um, you know, it's, it's, she lets you live with the characters in the larger space. 
and that's important to her aesthetic. And it, for me, it also reminds me a lot of our African filmmakers, that same um, ability to like, okay, we can let go of time here. We can just like have people exist in this space and see how they are in this space to actually like tell the story of whatever it is that we're, we're doing. So I think that's a really important um, intervention that she made into black cinema language. We have just been told we're gonna skip the Q&A, but we're gonna continue on our path. <laughs> um, okay, I was kind of curious about your thoughts on uplift cinema around this film, especially because of our leads professions, you know, one is a university professor and the other one is a successful artist. Um, and yeah, I'd be curious how, what are y'all's thoughts on the kind of complication of uplift, uplift cinema, uplift cinema, that this film kind of, you know, lends itself to? Well, I mean, I think, you know, on the surface, the film can be looked at like if you, if you are invested in questions around positive versus negative representation, which I'm always pushing really far against for my, my students in particular who like to like hang on to this, but like, you know, this, it kind of tricks you um, in a way by having um, two characters who are, you know, um, upper middle class, like in these elite type professions, um, but then digging, digging into um, their, I mean, you know, Victor is just like an asshole, you know, but, <laughs> um, but digging really deeply into like the, the ways in which they're more complex, they're more, there's more to say than just like these, these professions. Like it's, it's so much deeper with Sarah's character, the longing for something more, the longing for ecstasy, um, the inability to recognize where it, all is, where it already is in her life. Um, and then also the, the, the journey of seeking just something more, something deeper, some more passion, more life. Um, it, it really kind of just dismisses, I think, this, this, this constant push for a very simple understanding of characters in these particular type professions, you know? Like, Kathleen was so clear about not being interested in the extraordinary, and I think, um, by placing these characters in these very like elite um, careers, and then by really diving into all of the complexities around them, we're removing this like very surface reading of like, oh, this is a positive representation of you know black people in high professions. It is way way deeper. The conversation is so much more complex than that. So I don't even think it's even fair to like you know talk about this film in relation to. Um, those, those conversations around uplift and, and, and represent what should be, rep how black people should be represented on screen because she wasn't necessarily interested in that from what I understand. She was interested in digging, digging deep into these characters and really making you feel and understand what they were longing for um, and what they felt like they were missing. Even, you know, Victor being a jerk, you know, he was still longing for something more despite this experience of what uh, Sarah considered as e ecstasy. He was still in search of something that um, it was it didn't seem like he was able to find too. So yeah, I definitely like am uninterested <laughs> in this idea around like censoring their careers because of how intentional the characters are developed and it make you ask more harder questions for me. I, I agree. I mean, I think uplift cinema as a term goes to the early 1900s as we have scholar, scholar friends um, who write about this mode of production really being a pedagogical mode. And I don't think that she's a pedagogue, but this is not a pedagogical film. It's not trying to teach you anything about you. To me, what this film is trying to do is more in line with in the opening of Bell Hooks's book called Yearning, or the collection of, of short, she talks about a raisin in the sun, and is, is talking about Walter Lee Younger and you know, his, like, um, you know, his, his conviction when he's talking to Mama about what he wants. And I think there is more, this film is about a yearning. Um, it's about something else. It's not, 
it's not caught up in a positive, I, I would hate for somebody to say, this is a great representation of black women. I, uh, but it's not, that is not the modality of the film, nor the point. Um, and I don't even think, as we have heard from people's reactions in the, in the crowd and on the, that is not the purpose. Um, and there is just so much pleasure that this film is enacting. And I think if we think about it in terms of a yearning, sometimes the yearning is to see yourself on screen. Sometimes the yearning is to see um, a representation that feels familiar, um, that, um, that feels something. Because I don't think we've taken black feelings into account. And that's why I think she's working in more of an artistic sense, a Nikki Giovanni sense, uh, feeling black, black feelings. She wants to get the messiness of black feelings. And yearning is such a powerful and messy and can be upsetting and saddening feeling. So I think that's what this film sometimes inspires in, in, my, in, in, in my sense of where it comes as a, as a pedagogical experience. Okay, um, I, it's funny because like in line with that kind of like yearning, it, last night when it was mentioned that Adrian Piper was the first tenured black philosophy woman professor. Outside and, of Angela Davis. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, five years after the film was released, so it's like really wild that kind of like, it's almost like a painful yearning in that sense. Um, okay, I think we're out of time, but I want to thank everyone for coming out and my panelists. Um, and yeah, we hope you stick around for the reception. Thank you. Thank you.